The modern country of Iraq never existed as a state. It was cobbled together by the great powers, the European powers, after World War I, and they included three very distinct provinces under the Ottoman Empire into one state, and I think it's been a fundamentally unstable creation since it was pushed together badly after uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in World War I. In the state, you have really three states now within one, Kurds in the north, Sunnis in the center, Shiites in the south. And after the collapse of the Saddam regime, you effectively saw the country break down into its components. To the north, you had the province of Kurdistan that not only stayed in Iraq, it spilled over into Iran, into Syria, and into what, are now, what is now Turkey. So you had a large Kurdish region that when Iraq was formed in World War I was cut up into four states, and most of it stayed within what is now northern Iraq. And Kurds are, it's a different ethnic group. They look different. They have a different language. They, they have their, it's, a, it's an ethnicity. And Kurds are about 20% of the population. Then you have a Sunni triangle in the center of, of Iraq. Sunni Arabs are about 20% of the population. The Sunnis have a historic grievance. They ruled these areas for about 1,300 years until the U.S. military toppled Saddam's government, held elections, which benefited the majority of the population, who were the Shiites, and who took power. And then in the south, you have Shiites, and they're roughly about 60% of the population. Within this Shiite mini-state, you have the two cities of Najaf and Karbala, the most holy sites for Shiites anywhere in the world. The extremists in the Shiite camp, they believe that the Shiites are the true holders of the faith and that the Sunnis have just stolen power from them. This is the, the moment for revenge, that after 1,300 years of repression, this is a moment of religious ecstasy, and the Shiites have to take power and reclaim the mantle and, and take control of the, the, the lands of Islam in the name of Ali and Hussein. Some people have suggested just divide the state into three independent countries and be done with it. You have to understand where the oil is. Oil is essential to this equation. There is oil in Kirkuk, which is in Kurdish territory, and there is oil in Basra, in the south, in the, in the Shiite lands. The problem with dividing Iraq into three countries is that the Kurds have water and oil, the Shiites have oil and access to the Persian Gulf, the Sunnis, who ruled the country, are stuck with a, a desert area that has no direct access to fresh water, no access to the Persian Gulf, and no oil. So it would probably be a failed state. With the situation that exists in Iraq, it is all about geography. To understand Iraq, you have to understand the political and ethnic geography of the region. So it borders Iran, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and then to the south, the Persian Gulf. Iran, a large Shiite state, revolutionary, run by the Ayatollahs. It's a revolutionary theocracy. The population, Persian, not Arabs. It is the main dominant power rival in the region. Turkey, Turkish population, also a very large Kurdish population. It is a secular state run by the military. It has military relations with Israel, a NATO member, and has a Sunni population that is increasingly asking for more Islamic representation within the state. So it is a country that is very much at odds and torn uh, within itself. Syria is a relatively small country. It is a, a Sunni population. It is a Ba'ath Party dictatorship uh, run by a small religious minority. A lot of similarities to the way that Iraq was under Saddam Hussein. Jordan, small country again, Sunni population, very large Palestinian ethnic population, also a pro-American monarchy. It has a peace deal with Israel. Everything that, that happens in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and Israel has a direct implication and a direct impact on Jordan. Saudi Arabia, a Sunni state, 
the birthplace of Islam, home to Mecca and Medina. A hardline Sunni state, it does have a Shiite population, but effectively it is the backbone of Sunni Islam. Kuwait, a very small oil producing state right on the Persian Gulf. Kuwait has a Sunni leadership, a significant Shiite population, very concerned about Iran's expanding power because Iran is right next to it on the Persian Gulf and it does not want Iran to make the Persian Gulf effectively the Persian Gulf. I think people often think that this conflict in Iraq is only about religion. In fact, it's more, in my opinion, about geopolitics and the the dynamics within the region. And there is this split where you see the Arab states, Sunni Arab states, pushing on one side and the Persian Shiite state of Iran fighting for dominance on the other side. And right in the middle, right down this fault line, is Iraq with U.S. troops in the middle trying to keep these two, two sides from gaining dominance over the other. Immediately after the fall of Saddam's government, Iranian agents, religious pilgrims, intelligence officers, charities, all started to stream across the border. Iran is expanding into southern Iraq for several reasons. It wants to have access to the Shiite holy sites. Saddam Hussein didn't allow the Shiites to congregate in these huge mourning rituals that they hold to commemorate their martyrs. One of the first things that the Shiites did after the fall of Saddam was hundreds of thousands of people marched to Najaf and Karbala to, to hold this religious celebration that they had been banned from doing. Iran's motivations are religious to a degree, but also expanding because it can, and it wants to have a dominant relationship with its neighbor so that it can control the Persian Gulf. Sunni Arab states don't want to see the Shiites dominant in Iraq, don't want to see Iran expanding closer to their own borders. So many Sunni states, in particular Saudi Arabia, even Jordan to a degree, Syria, are all sending in people, not officially, but their populations are going in to be suicide bombers, to fund insurgent groups, to fight the Americans who let this happen, and to fight against the new Shiite-led Iraqi government and its own security forces. So the Kurdish dream is to form a Kurdish state that would incorporate their Kurdish brothers in Turkey, in Syria, in Iran. And they see this is their historic opportunity to have the country that they were denied. The Turks in particular, but also the Iranians and the Syrians, are very nervous about the birth of a modern Kurdish state. And the question is, how big is that country going to be? Is it just going to be an autonomous province within Iraq? They can probably accept that. But if it's going to be an independent state or a state that includes Kurds from their own countries, they will not accept that. As long as this remains a regional conflict and the war in Iraq remains a proxy war, it will be extremely difficult for U.S. troops to pull out because if U.S. troops left the country, there would be this enormous vacuum. The Sunni Arab states would be terrified that Iran would simply expand into Iraq and take over. Similarly, the uh, Iranians don't want to just leave this country, don't want to give up all of the ground that they have taken. So if U.S. troops simply walked away, this proxy war could develop into a much more active regional war. So what many in the region believe is necessary is to have a grand Middle East diplomatic initiative that tries to address the needs of Iran and of Saudi Arabia and the concerns of all of the parties involved so that this conflict doesn't just drag on for decades and, and U.S. troops are in a position where they can't leave.